Welcome to Dark Low Reviews, and for today's video, I'm going to review The Killer Shrews. The Killer Shrews is a 1959 American independent science fiction slash horror film directed by the former head of special effects for 20th Century Fox, Ray Kellogg, as a double feature along with his other film, The Giant Gila Monster. This film was also featured on Mystery Science Theater 3000. Oh, Ingrid is good, but... James is best. <laughs> I think so. Oh, ooh, I passed a blue stone last night, let me tell you. Oh. And it is deemed as one of the 50 worst films ever made. So let's check it out. The film begins with some spooky narration. Those who hunt by night will tell you that the wildest and most vicious of all animals... A Karen? The tiny shrew. The shrew feeds only by the dark of the moon. And the shrew devours everything. Bones, flesh, marrow, everything. Yeah, so does Ted Cruz. There were reports of a new species. The giant killer shrew. Now let's get to the opening credits. Yeah, the music sounds epic, but let's see if it pays off. And we fade into our protagonist, Captain Thorne Sherman, played by James Best, who was well known as Sheriff Roscoe P. Coltrane from Dukes of Hazard, and his first mate, Rook Griswold, played by Judge Henry Dupree, as they deliver supplies by boat to a group on a remote island. You know something? If this thing had an automatic pilot, I wouldn't have to put up with you. Then you wouldn't have nobody to chew out. That's true, and he does that along with the Duke boys. If I don't want you to see me giving them the second degree. That's the third degree, isn't it? No, the second degree is faster, you see. Oh, I'm going, I'm going. They meet a group consisting of Dr. Marlo Kragis, played by Baruch Lamette, his daughter Anne, played by former Miss Sweden and Miss Universe, Ingrid Good, and her former fiancé, Jerry Farrell, played by Ken Curtis, who was one of the co-producers of this movie, and was well known as a singer, and as Fetus Hagen from Gunsmoke. And they welcome the captain and his mate, but before the two visitors can become too comfortable, the islanders, to their surprise, begin to insist that the ship leaves immediately and takes Anne with them, even though a hurricane is fast approaching on the island. Thorne, however, insists the storm will be too severe for them to leave that night, and instead he goes with the researchers to their compound, while Griswold stays with the boat. You go right ahead and stretch your legs. That ship's gonna be bucking like a bucking bronze for long. Besides, I got some work left to do. And that was the last time I saw him. At the compound, Thorne meets more members of the group, like the servant Mario. It's me, Mario! And another research assistant, Radford Baines, played by Gordon McLendon, a co-producer of this film, and was well known as the Maverick of Radio. And he also does the narration at the beginning of the film. We'll tell you that the wildest and most vicious of all animals is the tiny shrew. Anyways, it turns out that Dr. Marlowe has been performing well-meaning genetic research and has been using shrews as test animals due to their short lifespan, allowing him to track his research progress over multiple generations. The doctor's purpose in these experiments is to isolate and manipulate the genes responsible for growth and metabolism in order to eventually shrink humans to half their size so as to reduce world hunger and overpopulation. He reasons being smaller will mean consuming less food in the world with a limited food supply. Oh look, and Radford brings out the first shrew of the film. What is that? It's a Sorex sericity. Looks like a small rat. Smells like a skunk. Well, how big do they get? That's an adult. According to that cue, it isn't good. Unfortunately, due to Jerry's drunken negligence, some of the shrews escaped and are now reproducing in the wild, growing larger and more ferocious by day. Because of your drunken stupidity in leaving the cage door open, you created the horrible situation that now exists. Look, Ann, this is a mistake any one of us might have made. Oh yeah, who hasn't released a dangerous experiment while drunk? Gradually, as they talk, Thorne and Ann become more and more attracted to each other, causing Jerry to become jealous. Wow. This is certainly a cozy little scene. 
Might even be called intimate. Boy meets girl. Stop and all... it, Jerry. That remark is uncalled for. What I do or have to say does not concern you. Hashtag feminism. Hashtag hashtag feminism. Anyways, when Griswold comes ashore, the shrews finally attack. <laughs> And fun fact, the shoes here are played by coon hounds in rugs, and a puppet was used for close-up. And the shoes kill Rourke. Rourke. Thorn decides to leap for Rourke, but Anne pulls a gun at him, forcing him to stay. Now look, I don't ask questions because it's against my principles. Wouldn't you like to explain that? All right. Sit down and I will. Give me the gun. Not very becoming anyway. Well, that was easy. Normally in these situations, it ends badly. And tells Thorne the truth about the shrews. There are two or three hundred giant shrews out there. Monsters weighing between fifty and a hundred pounds. And what's more, they are beginning to starve. And Thorn surprisingly believes her. No wonder you didn't want me to go out there. Thanks for saving my skin. Well, I'm sorry I had to threaten you with a gun. But I didn't know how else to stop you. Oh, it was very effective. Hmm. Maybe he's used to seeing shit like this. Then Dr. Marlowe tells Thorn about their situation with the shrews. We did everything in the world to exterminate them, but no apparent luck. But the fact that two of them charged Anne and Jerry at the gate last evening indicates that the available food on the island is nearing depletion. No shit, Sherlock. And then we get another moment with Anne and Thorne. You're a strange man, Thorne. I never met anyone like you. Oh? You seem so disinterested in everything. Yeah, that's because he's waiting for his check. Shortly afterwards, the shrews dig through the floor of the compound's barn and attack the livestock. Hearing the sound, Thorne nearly opens the door, but is stopped by Jerry's sucker punch. Marlowe then attempts to reassure Thorne that they are safe in the building from the shrews, but his attempts quickly falter when Thorne points out a fact the doctor has overlooked. The walls aren't, Doctor. They're adobe. Our safest bet would be on that boat. Yeah, good luck with that. Thorne makes a plan for each member of the group to take turns staying up as guard while the others sleep. But Jerry has other plans, like getting drunk as hell. Imagine a intelligent girl like her going for a common sea tramp like him. Yeah, he's an improvement over your drunk ass. Later that night, one of the shrews enters through a broken window and makes his way into the building. Mario locks the broken window and gets Thorn, and both men head to the basement to kill the shrew. Wait, Thorn killed the fucker first. He's dead. Anyways, Radford later discovers Mario's death was due to highly toxic venom in the dead shrew saliva, the result of the creatures adapting to the poison bait the researchers had placed in the wild in a previous attempt to kill them. Doctor, I wonder if you thought the system of the Sorex enabled them to assimilate that poison. It remained in the salivary glands of their jaws. Isn't that wonderful? Are you serious? As day breaks and the storm fades, Thorne and Jerry attempt to scout the path out of the compound. However, Jerry's jealousy over Anne's attraction to Thorne leads him to try to shoot him, but it ends badly. I'm telling you, stay away from her, and when the shrews get through with you, they won't even find a buckshot. <laughs> You were saying? During this mission, the two of them discover Rourke has been eaten. They don't leave much, do they? Oh no, he was like an all-you-can-eat buffet to them. The shrews then suddenly attack the two, 
and Jerry runs off like a bitch. They're coming! Jerry reaches the compound first and tries to leave Thorn locked outside, but Thorn manages to scale the compound's fence in time. The shoes were out there! I couldn't take a chance! <laughs> feelings, boy. Let the heat flow through you. <laughs> but sadly, Thorn spares his punk ass. What happened out there? Oh, nothing much. Jerry just tried to kill me twice in the last five minutes. Okay, I guess I'm just this entire family's toilet paper. After dragging Jerry back into the main building, the survivors regroup to try and come up with another plan. Need a drink. Anybody else care for one? I could use some coffee. I'll make some. Thank you, madam. Creamy sugar. Gotcha, bitch! Gotcha, bitch! As Rathford slowly dies, he records the symptoms of the venom on his typewriter, right up to the moment he finally kicks the bucket. As more and more giant shrews begin to chew through the now soft adobe walls, Thorn has the idea to tie empty chemical drums together and then duck walk to the beach. But due to his claustrophobia, Jerry refuses to get into the makeshift armor and isolates himself on the roof. When the coast seems clear, Jerry attempts to flee but trips. <laughs> and Marlowe, meanwhile, manage to reach the shoreline, and after ditching the barrels, they swim out to the boat. Safely aboard, Marlowe comments on the giant shrews. In 24 hours, there'll be one shrew left on the island, and he'll be dead of starvation. An excellent example of overpopulation. Well, you know something, Doctor? What's that? I'm not gonna worry about overpopulation just yet. Yeah, that's Thanos' job. And that was The Killer Shrew. The film was a commercial success at the time, but was panned critically. As I mentioned before, it gained a call following from being featured on Mystery Science Theater 3000, and it was shown in color, and it even got a sequel in 2012 called Return of the Killer Shrews, with James Best returning as Thorn Sherman. The length of the time between the original film's release and the sequel's release which is more than 50 years, is one of the longest time periods in movie history between the original and the sequels. Furthermore, it got a remake slash parody called Attack of the Killer Shrews in 2016. So in my opinion, this film isn't great compared to the other monster movies of the time. The acting is, you know, bad, and given how many times these characters drink, I doubt they enjoyed being there. And the film drags out a lot, especially during the talking scenes, which makes it boring to watch. And the only good part is when the shrews show up. For me, I'd rather stick with the MST3K version, as it's more entertaining than this one. And that was the video. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more videos just like this. Stay safe out there. Goodbye.